uh, Dominic Medley, what was it like in Kabul during the inauguration compared to your previous time and reporting trips? Um, uh, it was, um, what can I say, uh, there, was, uh, there was a tremendous atmosphere at the inauguration and people were, were very happy to be there. There was a sort of real establishment feel. The, um, there was a line of, of, of judges in fine judges' robes, the whole Supreme Court who'd come to support the, uh, the Chief Justice who administered the oath to the President. There was, a, there, was a, there was that wonderful sort of sense of Afghan formality and informality. I, I went in as the guest of one of the key reformers in, in uh, Ashraf Ghani's um, uh, government. And um, although he had a sort of formal seat at the front, uh, he didn't want to take that formal seat. He wanted to sit at the side with, with, with me and some other friends. And um, so chairs arrived uh, sort of over the heads of the crowd to, to add some more rows along the side. There was a, there was a rather a pleasant sort of informality to it. Um, there were different aspects of Afghan life represented in the Haram Sarai garden, that large garden, the internal courtyard in the, in the Arg, um, including at the back the orange hats of a representative group of Kabul street sweepers. Um, so there was a real sense of, of um, trying to bring um, all of Afghan society into the, into the room. Um, and uh, it was quite striking, again, these young reformers, um, the former head of procurement, who's now become the chief of staff in the palace, was sworn in uh, just after Ashraf Ghani in, in quite a formal move. Now, this, this man is a, you know, is a PhD student from America in his mid-30s. Um, and uh, to see somebody like that taking such responsibility in, um, you know, against you know, the warlords and rockets coming in and, and, and all, of the, all of the tensions and threats of Afghanistan. Um, so there was a... There was a, I suppose, I suppose there was a, I, I would say there was a good atmosphere, Dominic, in, you know, for the inauguration. And, and, a, and there wasn't any sense that, you know, next door there was this great frightening thing going on. I, I think the, the presidential security is, you know, has been as good as it has been against that. Um, uh, Michael, I see Francis Van Drell popping up at the bottom. Is he going to speak? Indeed, he, he had asked to do so, but he yes. disappeared. I've just, Francis, have, did, I, have I disappeared? No, yes. no, you've disappeared from the participants list, but not... Oh, I don't mind that. But can you hear me? Yes, you can. Francis, how are you? Well, fine, thank you. And um, thanks for a very interesting uh, presentation, David. Um, I I'm, I'm a little surprised <laughs> that you seem to feel that Ghani is the legitimate elected president, uh, f mainly because he got 50 point one or whatever it was of the vote, and I and it's a bit hard to believe that there was no uh, fraud at all in the counting of of those votes. Um, secondly, um, it's interesting that the U.S. government in in the in the Doha agreement, the word uh, Islamic State of uh, Islamic Republic of Afghanistan does not appear once. What does appear, as you said, is Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, not recognized by the US and called Taliban. Uh, the, the, the fact that the Americans appear to be committing the Afghan government to release 5,000 prisoners without they being involved in the talks it's an incredible put down on the Kabul authorities. I, I won't even say the government. And uh, there is no uh, demand in the Doha agreement for a ceasefire after the, uh, after the signature of the agreement. And in, indeed, um, uh, even if there were a ceasefire, which certainly where the Taliban are not at all committed to, uh, who is going to uh, monitor a ceasefire, which would be very difficult to, uh, to monitor unless you had a very well-established um, military, um, military group of uh, an outside military group, perhaps a UN military group, to um, oversee the ceasefire. So that's, that, I'm, I'm spoken enough. 
No, Francis, I think those, those are two really interesting points. I mean, on the uh, on the ceasefire point, I mean, your 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 experience in Kabul, you know, back in the early days is 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 um, you know you, is absolutely drawn on in that, and your 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 experience internationally. But the sense that, uh, and I think I hinted at this when I was talking about the idea of there being a sort of you know unilateral um, coronavirus ceasefire. Um, you know, ceasefires are very complicated things and need guarantees on all sides. Now, and I think the international community, Britain, um, among the countries, um, should play its role in uh, trying to facilitate real understanding of the complexities of um, what the modalities of a ceasefire might be, because clearly that's going to be something that's that's going to be very hard. And I absolutely agree with you that the um, the Doha deal is you know, a punch in the face for the Kabul government, um, but it comes from an American government that wants to pull out of Afghanistan by the end of this year um, and sees, um, uh, you know, with President Trump want, needing to be able to say to the electorate, you know, I stopped that war, I have brought the boys home. And, uh, you know, that's a, that's a very, very strong dynamic in all this. And um, uh, Kalazad um, has, you know, an amazing ability to, Put his hand around the shoulders of people and say it'll all be all right i'll bring it you know i'll bring you to the table everything will be fine and keep all these plates spinning in the air but at the end of the day he had to bring something to the table and, and what he brought to the table is 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 very strongly um uh, uh, dressed up in taliban language and uh not demanding much from them and uh, making demands of the of the uh, of the afghan government as far as your first point, and you, of course, um, chair the Afghan Analyst Network, and Thomas Ruttig has been doing some very excellent analysis of the of, of the election potential election fraud and everything that went on. But when it comes to it, as the international community, having um, paid for um, uh, about a third of this election, the Afghan government paid two thirds themselves this time, um, and having supported the uh, reforms as far as we did in terms of, of creating Tashkiras and the election scrutiny bodies, if it comes out after pretty exhaustive work over several months that it is 50 plus, you know, point of point percent, um, and even frankly anything close to 50 um, uh, would be a victory for um, Ashraf Ghani, and that's the system that we've got. And as sometimes, you know, uh, it's it's easy for the international community to um, to say, well, look, you know, we spend all this money, therefore we can run things, um, particularly on the American side. But, you know, democracy is democracy. And I, I remember going into a, a village in Logar province in uh, 2009 during the long arguments that summer about the, uh, the election um, when the Americans and the British were very much uh, trying to uh, destabilise the, the possibility of Karzai returning as president. And you know these these men in the village who sat around the tree and uh, talked to the BBC um, um, didn't like it much. They they said, well, look, you know, we wouldn't have necessarily have had democracy, but you've in, you've installed this democracy. This is the way that we choose our rais, um, and we've chosen him, and and you should stand back and and let that happen. And I think there's a there's a there's a strong sense um, this time that you know the Americans are fixing it again. The turnout was only. I believe as as low as it was because of the sense that they'd fixed it before that whatever you do the, the Americans will, will, will bring a national unity government and this this just sort of proves that in a way um, on the part of, of many people there are lots of chats um, so let me get let me should I carry on with the chats Michael Is I, that the best way? I, could I just um, uh, chip in there Dave because we've got some questions on the question channel as well um, apologies by the way for my brief disappearance a few minutes ago the power failed here. Um, um, a question from um, Christopher Callagher. How can the government both improve its technical capacity while also preparing for the presumed implementation of a peace agreement, DDR, jobs, programmes, etc.? Well, I, I, I mean, I think they need to be, they need to be done both at the same time. Um, um, uh, you know that we and that absolutely is something that we can do. I mean, there's been a variety of technical capacity improvement programs which have been run by DFID and other um, international organisations, which have made a difference in terms of you know tax collection, um, the ability of the government to tell its story, media training, 
um, uh, Dominic, who was on earlier on, uh, you know, um, very prominent in that in the early years, really creating a free media in Afghanistan. All of those were technical capacity building done by um, the international community over the years. And we, I think we just have to carry on doing it. Could I pick up um, a question from, from Hookie Walker? What, what are the chances for the continuation of women's education? Okay, hello. Um, um, uh, th that's an absolutely crucial element. Um, uh, that Even the Taliban send their daughters to school. They're a different Taliban from the past, and uh, they, they send them to you know, normal schools, as it were. They're not insisting, as they were back in the 1990s, that only Islamic education and only up to a certain age. So I think that I think there has been a, a bit of a change. I'm not saying that the Taliban, if they came back into power, would you know would uh, necessarily be brilliant for women's rights. I think they'd be appalling. Um, but um, it's something that we have to continue to put pressure on. One of my big fears about the uh, the sort of despair and we lost, uh, it, it just get over it sense that you get from the American political establishment and the American security establishment. Um, you know, former generals who served in Afghanistan writing books called Why We Lost um, and the sense of a sort of, of, of a lost campaign um, and uh, just sort of handing it over to the Taliban. And there are some in the, Amer in the Afghan government who fear this too. They fear that, uh, that once you engage in peace talks, then that means um, that you, you hand it all over to the Taliban, of course, with, with all of the problems that would, that would come with women's rights and the, you know, the end to girls' education. It's become harder than it was, uh, interestingly, because the Taliban are, and insecurity has increased in the last couple of years to really carry out education reforms that matter. Um, but those people like yourself who really care about it internationally, you know, will continue to, uh, to, try, and, uh, to try and build the capacity in Afghanistan. And, and, and the will is certainly there for, um, for uh, Afghan schools and girls to be properly educated. Thank you, David. There's one last question up on, on, on the screen there from Zaria Khanna. What, what is the role of Pakistan now and going forward? Well, I think, I, I mean, I, I had a go at this, you know, just before with uh, Ayub Khan's question about Pakistan. I think, you know, there's a, there's, there's a very strong need for the international community to be united over Pakistan's engagement um, uh, with the Taliban. And, um, to, to say to them, and this is certainly something that Ashraf Ghani tried to do in his early years, to try and bring all of the uh, neighbouring countries, particularly Central Asia, to uh, agreement that cross-border terrorism is something that we just don't do um, and shouldn't be done. And of course, you know, if there can be a, um, some sort of a, an agreement, including India, um, uh, in that direction, then that would make um, all sorts of positive uh, differences. So I think um, you know, there are things that the international community can do, there are a variety of circles, you know, uh, the, the, the big powers, the neighbouring powers, um, uh, Afghanistan working bilaterally with Pakistan to try and improve relations. Um, but until uh, and unless uh, the Pakistani government um, sever their links with the Haqqani network, who are pretty dug into Punjab province itself, um, pretty connected to the same families that uh, send send sons to to, to join the, uh, the 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 Pakistani army. Send other sons and, and cousins to join um, to join the Haqqani network. I mean, there is a there and to join these other uh, in, international insurgent groups. There is a, a a pretty deep issue inside Pakistan, and I think the international community really needs to to address it. Thank you. Um, should we go back to the um, the, the the questions? Yeah. On the side, that, yeah. Yes, um, Dan Huntington. If the flawed peace process fails, will the international forces disappear, and will the Taliban likely come back to power, or is that the is that is the U.S. bluffing? I mean, I think uh, Dan, you know, given the um, temperament of the American president. Um, it's hard to it's hard to tell you know bluff or or because things could happen uh, tomorrow. I mean there 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 is a real sort of sense that you know the, the president could wake up one morning and say right there's, we're, we're over with that let's pull out. Um, and uh, so the, the, but there are some pretty good people on the ground. The, the current commander is deeply engaged. General Scott Miller has been deeply engaged um, um, in Afghanistan previously with with special forces. Knows the country very well. 
um, has uh, really tried to um, uh, make a genuine difference during the time that he's there in terms of, of, of changing the situation on the ground, continuing to put significant military pressure on the Taliban at the same time as standing up the Afghan forces, which is the only way of persuading the Taliban that uh, peace talks you know, will have to uh, be the only way out. Um, so if the flawed, I think we're a long way from the, the peace process failing. Um, it, it could take you know, up to four or five years. That's the sort of time that, uh, that it'll take. Look, this week, um, there's already a slippage with this uh, discussion over one of the very first you know, bits of confidence building in terms of prisoner releases um, because of the, uh, uh, what the Taliban insisted. So trying to get that back on track with track two talks, um, um, uh, facilitators in Doha over the next couple of weeks is going to be the, um, the next issue. Um, so I think there's going to be real bumps along the road. And that's where having a sense of, you know, four or five year engagement, um, you know, keeping this president engaged through the election, keeping American troops there into next year. Um, uh, now, of course, if Biden wins the election, um, he has been very strongly against anything other than counterterrorism. He was the strongest argument, uh, strongest voice in the uh, Obama administration for a very, very light military footprint. And it'd be hard to argue either with Trump or Biden in uh, the White House that American troops should stay for the kind of time uh, that this peace talk, this peace process is going to take. Um, but let's see what sort of, uh, what sort of um, uh, councils prevail over the next couple of years in the United States. Um, <laughs> It's a nice question. I'll try and answer it. Clive Newell, you mentioned the Afghan assumptions about American motives and future actions. Um, is there a current stereotypical view of the British? The, the Afghan, the, the, the deep Afghan view of the British is that we're actually sort of behind everything, that, that, the, that, the, um, uh, that the Americans only really, the Taliban only operate in Helmand because the British want them to. They wanted to be there. And so they, they, they somehow stood up the Taliban. The, you know, there's only poppies grown because the British wanted them to. You know, we're somehow seen as this, as this um, you know, the, the Sirdar, the old, the, the old power, the old command um, uh, that goes right. There's a sort of thought that goes right back. Um, uh, there's also a stereotypical view of the British, of course, that they can be beaten, um, going back to the Battle of Maiwand in 1880. So the sort of sense that um, the sense that, that the Afghans can beat anybody, including the British, you know, the the graveyard of empires stuff, which is which is a strong, um, or a flawed but a strong narrative in in um, the Afghan uh, imagination. Um, but I have to say. Um, in as much as they think about us at all, they don't think about us as much as we perhaps think. Um, uh, the, the, the standard um, word in, in the Afghan countryside um, 20 or 30 years ago for, or, or, or earlier for a foreigner was angrazi, which is a corruption of English, which went right back to the very first travellers in the beginning of the 19th century. And the word for a foreigner in the Afghan countryside now is Ameriki. So people say to you, are you an Ameriki? Um, and so that that sort of change. I mean, I think we're 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 quite small on the um, on the on the uh, the imagination of of many, particularly young people in in Afghanistan, except those ones who want to come here and go to university, of course. <clears throat> and David, could I chip in with a question of of my own? I mean, while you were when you were talking at an earlier stage, you touched on the sort of issue of, you know, the American sort of despair narrative, we've been beaten and, uh, and we, we just have to go. And, and of course, there have been times when the British media have, have taken that kind of line as well. Um, uh, you, you mentioned the word partition. And from my own time in Afghanistan, one of the things that I think surprised me most was that it, we never heard Afghans talking about partition. I mean, they might have been Tajik or Pashtun or whatever, but they considered, they seemed all to consider themselves Afghan first. They did not look, even at the height of the civil war, there was nobody there arguing for partition. Has that changed, do you think? No. Uh, if anything, I think it's rather stronger. And there are 
a variety of things. Um, and Tolo TV has been rather important in this, actually, in a number of the things that they've done. Things like uh, the football teams, you know, the North, South, East, West football teams, the, um, uh, the football final two or three years ago when there was a bomb at the stadium um, the evening before. And it was the first uh, day night game that there'd been. And uh, um, so they were playing, you know, uh, under floodlights. And even though there was a bomb the day before, the Afghan arm, uh, there's a group of Afghan soldiers who carried this enormous uh, Afghan flag across the football pitch um, before, the, um, before the game. And there was a video that went viral with a singer um, singing the Afghan national anthem to those pictures. And people are, pe you know, the, the, the flag, uh, the, uh, the flag football cricket, um, um, uh, the army, are all things that people are, are very um, passionately um, Afghan about. Um, although that, there is this issue with, which emerged um, when they started issuing these national identity cards a couple of years ago, the, the, the new Tashkiras, that, uh, that people they wanted to put ethnic identity on the on the um, on the cards. And for many Afghans, um, Afghan means Pashtun. So there are non-Pashtun Afghans like Tajiks who while they're citizens of Afghanistan, do not see themselves as Afghans. Um, so there are issues about identity which are quite complicated in terms of this being a nation. Um, um, but a nation it is. Thank you. Um, there's, um, I mean... There's a question I'd like to answer. Go on. <laughs> um, what have been the greatest accomplishments and failures of the yeah. West in Afghanistan? Thank you, Jay Patel, for this question. Are there any lessons you think that Western governments will heed in the future? Um, well, on the whole, we're not, we've not, we're not very good at learning lessons and international intervention is very much off the agenda for uh, countries, particularly because of Iraq and Libya and a number of other disasters in the last uh, 15 years. Afghanistan, it, the, the jury's still out, although in America increasingly the jury is, is saying this has been a, this has been a failure. Um, I think uh, the failures were not having enough security in the early years. Um, I, I think very strongly and not having enough security and not having enough international ability to um, have troops who were trained to stabilize the country. I'm, I'm, I'm actually writing a book about this very subject at the moment. Um, and uh, in the early years, there was very much a sense from America that the Taliban had been defeated. Um, and that somehow democracy would sort of, you know, spring up on every, and there'd be a McDonald's on every street corner before you knew it. Um, and of course, it's more complicated than that, particularly after all the years of uh, state failure and civil war and uh, um, disagreement in, and uh, all the other tensions which had come in Afghanistan. And so what we saw, rather than um, the the return of a democratic government after 9-11 when the when the Taliban were defeated was the return of the very people who had been defeated by them in the mid 90s who'd, who'd brought rack and ruin to the country um, who pretty quickly took power again um, principally the, the, the Tajik warlords from the north but other other warlords right across the country and began to steal customs dues and all the other things that they were doing in the early 1990s and Rooting that out over the last couple of decades has been really, really, really difficult to do. Um, but had we at the beginning put in um, 20, 50, um, the, the, the first ISAF commander uh, thought 25,000 troops would be enough. The, the main coordinator of uh, Richard Haas of the Afghanistan program for the United States thought perhaps about 30,000 American troops and 30,000 NATO troops. But again, troops you know configured to stabilize to build bridges to have sort of engineers customs officials people not just infantry not just um, fighting troops but enough fighting troops at a time when they were welcome um, and uh, uh, rather than coming in later when they were less welcome because there was already insecurity and the Taliban had returned uh, would have been something um, that I think was the was the really significant failure in those um, in those early years and um, uh, since then, a number of things have, have gone much better. The surge in 2009 made a difference. Counterinsurgency um, uh, practice did make a difference in Afghanistan in terms of, of, of fighting the war. We began to learn that um, building government budgets and building state institutions is rather better than building a parallel state um, outside the government. Um, and, uh, you know, Afghanistan has been a crucible where um, you know, after 2014, when there was this triple transition of, 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 of combat troops pulling out, 
um, the election um, and this huge uh, drop off in aid, um, it turned out that uh, when the aid dropped off, um, it was as if uh, we built a lot of scaffolding. Um, but when the scaffolding was taken down, there was no building behind it. The institutions that were built um, were not as, as, as successful or as well funded as those groups who'd, who'd been there building them. So I think there were, you know, there are a number of things that can be learned right across the, uh, the, 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 the joining up the development and diplomatic and military world, but whether those lessons are being learned in a world which is very keen now, the West not to get in, uh, involved in these kinds of things again, um, is, a, is a more difficult question. And uh, a very good place, I think, David, for us to stop, because I <clears throat> can't actually uh, anticipate that we're going to end up in a, a more positive place if we ask more questions. But I, 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 from my own experience, I do absolutely agree with you that the um, uh, uh, the early years feel uh, and and have for some time felt like a slightly lost opportunity. Um, having said that, um, thank you very much to everybody. I'm sorry for the 31 people who are still asking asking questions. Um, <laughs> we, 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 can, we can perhaps try to answer some of them offline. Um, uh, but as, um, uh, thank you very much for, for all, uh, joining us. We've had people from uh, a, a huge range. I, mean, I, I can see from the list of participants, we have participants from the, uh, the East Coast of the United States online, for example, and it's very good. Uh, to, to have you um, here. I'm Ron Rosner, I'm particularly talking about. Um, <coughs> um, and we will be aiming uh, to do more of these uh, over the coming weeks. Um, it's clearly going to be quite some time before we're in a position to hold face-to-face -face meetings again. Um, but even when it is, uh, I, this is a format that offers things that um, are, are not possible uh, on a face-to-face -face basis and um, David thank you very much indeed um, uh, you managed to stay online from Wales more consistently than I did in central London I'm not quite sure what happened there was a sudden sort of power failure and my computer just turned off um, but there we go thanks for, thanks for the opportunity it's been a fascinating hour it has indeed thank you um, and uh, thank you to everyone who's stayed with us through all of this. Thank you. Bye-bye.